in the previous lecture we have talked about uh, uh, introduced heat capacity and we have told that there are uh, two types of heat capacity at constant volume and heat capacity at constant pressure. So Cv is heat capacity at constant volume, Cp is heat capacity at constant pressure, we have introduced the concept of enthalpy and then we told what is the, we ended uh, here, we told what would be the Cp minus C or difference between heat capacity at constant pressure and heat capacity at constant volume for an ideal gas. So if we want to do that, so as we know, if we recall, Cp is del H del T, H is enthalpy, del H del T at constant pressure and Cv is del U del T at constant volume. Now, for ideal gas, it becomes pretty easy because you have the equation of state, right? This is the equation of state. Now, you know del W, this is reversible work obviously, is equal to minus P dV and it's mechanical work. And you also know from first law that du equals delta q plus delta w. Now since you know that, you will also know delta q which is the heat input is equal to du plus p dv because del w is minus p dv if the work done on the system is positive and del w is minus p dv. Uh, uh, this we already have uh, found out. So delta q is du plus p dv. Uh, du is cv dt plus p dv. Right, because as you see from this definition, from the definition here, that du is nothing but CVDT and you have PD. Right, now you see delta Q, if I tell constant pressure, that means P is constant, then I can write delta Q is nothing but, del basically it is like delta QP is nothing but dH which is nothing but CPDT. So du is CVDT and delta Q is CPDT. So you can see now you have DT here, you have DT here, you have DT here and you have CPDT equals to CVDT plus PDV. Now PDV I have changed to NRDT, you can easily see. So you have PV equals to NRT, you have PV, PDV plus VDP. From PV you can write PDV plus VDP, like this basically nothing but D of PV which is equals to PDV plus VDP which is equals to now this DPV is D N R T. Now if N is constant if uh, pressure is constant and N is also constant, as the mole number is constant, then you have, uh, you see R is anyway constant, it is universal gas constant and so you have RT dN, this RT dN term will go to 0 because N is constant. So PdV plus VdP, now if pressure is constant then VdP, this term will go to 0, right. So you have PdV which is equals to NRDT, right. PdV equals to NRTT and so you have substituted here, so you have got CPDT, you got CPDT, CVDT and NRDT. Now you can rearrange and you can write Cp minus Cv equals to NR. Remember N is the number of moles of the ideal gas. However, when it comes to non-ideal gases or any other substance, you will see that it becomes slightly more complex. In fact, knowing the definition of entropy becomes very useful there uh, or applying Maxwell relations that we will learn soon will be useful there. So I will come up to that but please remember that there is a difference in heat capacity at constant pressure and heat capacity at constant volume and for ideal gas that difference is equal to NR, right. Now remember we are talking about ideal gases but we know that there are, uh, ideal gases have there is no interaction force between the ideal gas molecules, right? That's the idea. Ideal gas atoms do not interact with each other. That is, there is no force of interaction between them. However, for real gases, you have interactions. 
right between the constituent atoms that is there is a force of interaction between the constituent atoms or molecules now in such a case in such a case u is also a function of v see the problem is uh, when you have no interactions then basically we can tell that in such a case the change in internal energy is only because of change in temperature change in volume or basically pressure does not affect it but when it comes to uh, as you know as you recall that u is an exact du is an exact differential and du equals to if i tell u is a function of t and v for example if i tell u is a function of t and v we can write du equals to del u del t v dt plus del u del v constant temperature dv right and this part this this part this one is your cv right this is equal to your cv so basically you can write this is equal to cv dt and i const uh, and del u del v t let me call it pi del u del v t let's call it pi t plus pi t t now as you can see that the change in energy is of uh, is related to change in temperature and that is the relation that the, the um, that relation what you get is uh, cv uh, at constant volume and if you use constant temperature you have something called pi t which is like pressure now in such a case this pi t basically becomes non zero when you have interacting gases or real gases in ideal gases pi t is zero because in ideal gases the interaction force between constituent molecules or atoms is not there so there is only so there is only kinetic energy there is only temperature that is relevant and change in temperature and change in temperature causes change in internal energy of the ideal gas however change in pressure so change in volume does not change in volume does not <coughs> now if there is change in volume there is no change in internal energy so if you now look at it so if you look at the energy of an ideal gas which is 3 by 2 rt again so this is one thing that i have to tell 3 by 2 if i tell 3 by 2 rt this 3 by 2 rt what's the unit this is something that r is joules per r generally is given as joules per mole kelvin so when i am talking about energy of an ideal gas we are already talking of energy per mole if i just write 3 by 2 rt so if i have to write 3 uh, if i have to write the energy of an ideal gas containing n moles it will be 3 by 2 nrt right so basically that's why there is something called molar heat capacity which is cvm which is basically so here this has to be 3 by 2 nrt where n is the number of moles this is something that you have to understand this will come soon of ideal gas so the molar heat capacity is per mole so it is cv comma m which is nothing but cv by n where n is the total number of moles of a substance now you see for a real gas as i told you u versus b also has, u versus v also has a slope now what type of slope is it and why is it this slope so this is something that we have to understand so as you can see look at this equation let us look at this let us have a look at this equation first you have du from your exact differential you got du equal to cv dt where cv is the heat capacity at constant volume plus pi t dv and pi t and also you know du Equals to delta Q minus P V. If you compare, you see, pi T is nothing but minus P, which we can call as internal pressure. Pi T is nothing but an internal pressure because Minus P D V when we are doing what we were looking at, we are looking at 
something like this. I have a piston here, and then I had a volume, and the volume was reducing. So initially, I had a volume here. Right, initial volume was like V, and then it decreased by an amount of dV. Right, there is a decrease in the amount by the amount dV, and dV is negative, and P is the external pressure. So as a result, you have to put a minus P dV because work done on the system is positive. That was our convention, according to our convention. Now pi t, if you see, has a negative, has a negative. Uh, it, it is pi t same as pressure, but Pi t has a plus in front of it, right? It has a negative. It's basically, pi t has a sign opposite to that of the uh, of p, right? So here p is the external pressure, and pi t is something like an internal pressure. Now, if you see what I told that since there is no interaction in ideal gas, there is no interaction between molecules, no interaction between molecules. As a result, pi t equal to c. However, for real gases, there is interaction between molecules. Now, if that is so, then you have this surface. This surface where u is plotted, so you have u going up, and temperature is increasing as you can see here, and v is decreasing as you can see. Here. So, as you can see. Now look at the slope. Now, if it is u versus v, if you look at the slope, the slope increases as v decreases, right? So as v is decreasing, the slope is increasing or internal energy is increasing. Internal energy increases as the volume decreases, right? That is uh, for a real gas. The interactions become more and uh, the, the interactions become more and more uh, effective. Means that the the, the 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 contribution from the interactions increases. Um, uh, to the internal energy increases as you decrease the volume, right? As you decrease the volume. On the other hand, as you increase temperature, the the as you increase temperature means uh, with temperature, you generally will see that there is a upward slope, right? So basically, if you look at the slope that we are showing here, you can see there is a downward slope. Now, if I do u versus t, it should be an upward slope, right? So if I look at say u versus t here. This is your. Let me draw with another color, uh, just to distinguish. Yeah. So if you see, if you have u this axis, u along y axis, and t along x axis, in general. You will see the slope will be going something like this, right? So you you go something like this. So you will have a positive slope. So from u, so as v increases, internal energy decreases. So as you can see here, so what we can say here is that as from these curves or even from this surface, you can tell that as T increases as T increases, U increases. There will be an increase in U, right? With the increase in temperature, there will be an increase in U. However, as V increases, U will go down, and this is basically true for real gases or Real systems with interactions, right? So, with increase in temperature, internal energy increases. With increase in volume, internal energy decreases. Okay. So, another thing that you have to uh, often you will see that we are often refer to something called specific heat. heat. Specific heat in general is defined as heat capacity per unit mass, like heat capacity per gram. Uh, per Kelvin or heat capacity per kg per Kelvin like that and uh, molar heat capacity is um, uh, per unit mole right it is uh, CVM for example is molar heat capacity at constant volume CPM is molar heat capacity at constant pressure 
Now, as you know, Cp minus Cv equals to Nr, where N is the number of moles. So now smaller heat capacity, Cp, M minus Cv, M molar equals to R, because R is joules. So and it has a unit of joules per mole. Okay. These are things that you should understand. So for example, if I take this and if I tell uh, heat capacity, so if I tell specific heat of water at room temperature and one atmosphere pressure is 4 joules per kelvin per gram. Now, if I tell you what will be its molar heat capacity, what will you do? You know, you are talking of water, water molecule H2O, there are 2 H molecule, uh, 2 H atoms, there are 2, in a, one molecule of water, there are 2 H atoms and 1 O atom and as you know H has an atomic mass of 1 atomic mass unit or you can uh, convert it to grams, then it becomes 1 gram and oxygen has 16 grams. So basically the atomic mass of water in grams, if I tell, Now, now that means you have 18 grams as that with ma mass and you have gram here. So, you have a unit of 4 joules by Kelvin gram. Now, you are telling a uh, gram and you want to convert it to mole. So, 1 mole of H2O or water contains 18 is basically 18 grams of water. So, 1 gram is 1 by 18. So, basically this will become 1 gram is basically 1 by 18. So, 18 to 4, 72 joules per kelvin. Right? So, basic because the molecular weight of water is 18, right? It is, uh, so the molecular weight of water is 18, 1 mole contains 18 grams of water and 18 grams equal to 1 mole, therefore 1 gram equals to 1 by 18 moles and I am just, instead of 1 gram, I am putting 1 by 18, so 18 into 4, it becomes 18 to 4 which is 72, so 72 joules per Kelvin per mole is the molar heat capacity, it's the molar heat capacity of water. Right? So, this is how from specific heat you can go to molar heat capacity. Now, you know the relation between Cp and Cv when you have ideal gas that Cp molar minus Cv molar is equals to R. But what about all substances? Now, see, we will now define more measurable quantities. So, we already know about measure, what are the measurable quantities T, P and then C, P and C, V you can obtain using calorimetry. Okay, I, I, I will discuss maybe later uh, some principle of calorimetry, but that is the, that you have a standard sample based on the standard sample, when you look at how much it is transferred and you can calculate C, P or C, V, right? You can use like bomb calorimetry and stuff. Now, the point is Cp and Cv, there is a difference with R for ideal gas and but for in general, what is the relation between Cp and Cv for say some any real gas or for solid or for liquid. So, in such cases, we need to know some two more measurable quantities. One measurable quantity which is of, it's, which is of interest is volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion alpha, right. You, you often know about the linear coefficient of thermal expansion. Now, what we are defining here is a thermal expansion coefficient that is volumetric. So, this is defined as how the volume of a material will change as temperature changes keeping pressure fixed. So, volume change as a function of temperature keeping pressure fixed and normalized with the volume itself, volume of the body itself. So, it is 1 by V del V del T P which is basically alpha, right. So, del V del T P. P. So, volume is like centimeter cube and this is like Kelvin 
but you have 1 by v a normalization so it's like 1 by centimeter cube so this becomes it's, it has the unit of kelvin inverse the unit is kelvin inverse its temperature inverse basically so 1 by v del v del t now there is also something called compressibility or uh, which is uh, represented as beta or kappa t so kappa t or beta is basically change in volume with respect to change in pressure again normalized by the volume so this is called and remember temperature is kept constant here so it is called isothermal means it's a isothermal compressibility isothermal because temperature is kept constant compressibility and that is there is a negative sign here i will tell you why it becomes there should be a negative sign here because we are looking at compression right you are looking at compression and again as i told you that as you increase pressure volume decreases right so there is a obviously a negative sign that we want to uh, put in here so it becomes minus 1 by v del v del v t now these are two more measurable quantities so we are basically finding out different measurable quantities that we can measure as like see thermodynamics in general are deal with macroscopic quantities not molecular level quantities and in the macroscopic quantities that are measurable are more and more are more useful because there will be quantities such as energy for example which is not directly measurable right but you can measure temperature you can measure pressure using a parameter temperature using a thermometer you can measure uh, use calorimeters to measure uh, heat capacities uh, whether it is at constant pressure or at constant volume also you can measure the coefficient of thermal expansion and coefficient of compressibility now if you know how to measure all of these then you will see we will use Maxwell's relations data so I am not immediately going to give you the proof but what I am going to give you is the what I am going to do is I will state the relations so, Cp minus Cv equal to alpha square Tv by upper T or alpha square Tv by beta. Now as you can see here alpha is your thumb coefficient of thermal expansion, upper T is isothermal compressibility. T is temperature, V is volume. Volume is again measured. Now uh, think of an ideal gas again. In your ideal gas, if you know PV equals to nRT, if you look at alpha in that case for this PV equal to nRT equation state, you will see alpha is nothing but 1 by T. It is inverse of the temperature for an ideal gas. And kappa T is nothing but 1 by T. Now if you look at that, like the kappa T is nothing but minus 1 by V del V del P. So, you have alpha square T V so it is A naught T by P square V because V is there and del V del P is what you are looking at. So you are writing V equals A naught T by P. So there is a minus sign, so minus and here there is a minus sign, so it becomes plus, right? This becomes plus. And uh, so then you get nothing but A naught T is P V, P V by P square V is one by Right. So, you get this uh, value here and so you get, if you substitute all of these here, alpha square T V by K T is nothing but P V by T because 1 by is NR by P V is 1 by T and there is a T and V, T T goes out, there is a V um, alpha square, so there is a T square, so V by T by 1 by P which is PV by T, which is nothing but equal to E. Right? So, you can see that this relationship definitely holds for ideal gas. But this relationship holds for, holds good for any substance, whether it is liquid water, whether it is a solid ice, whether it is for any material, this relation holds. And then you require to know the alpha, you require to know the isothermal compressibility of the material. And obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, let me tell you what will be say for condensed phases, what will be the isothermal com uh, compressibility? How much is the isothermal compressibility? If you know, then you can see how much is the difference between Cp and Cv for solids and liquids in general. Okay, so that is the idea. Only thing I can tell you since beta is small mm, in general for solids uh, and alpha is also actually small, but um, let us think of aluminium for example, if you see for aluminium, it is aluminium solid, 
you have uh, okay so it's one by pressure so it's is pascal inverse so for aluminium it is 1.385 10 minus 11 pascal inverse is your isothermal compressibility and alpha is 69.3 10 to the minus 6 per kelvin and let us take the temperature T equal to 298 kelvin which is basically room temperature 25 degrees celsius and let us take the molar volume of aluminium let us assume at 298 kelvin and not assume means you can measure it you, you will find that it is approximately 10 to minus 5 meter cube per mole. Now in such a case if you add all of these so basically you get and one atmosphere as you know is 101325 pascals right 101325 pascals. So if you evaluate this what you get is like 1 joule per mole kelvin. Okay, on the one, on one, can, on hand, you have like Cp minus Cv, which is R, which is like 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. On the other hand, you, you, for solid aluminium, Cp minus Cv is small, right? Many a, Cp minus Cv is small. Many a times we use this approximation of Cp is approximately equal to Cv, or we tell that the PV work, uh, contribution is very small. And we, we often use one type of its capacity. We use one type of its capacity, which is, which is basically we substitute. We neither use Cp nor Cv, but we directly tell C for uh, as the heat capacity. Means we tell that Cp minus Cv, Cp minus Cv is small, we can think of heat capacity at constant volume at or at constant pressure many times you take Cp heat capacity at constant pressure as the heat capacity of solids and liquids. So C is the heat capacity it can be either Cp or Cv because Cp minus Cv is small for solids and liquids. So basically when you tell this what we tell is basically H equals to U plus Pv in Pv work for, for for normal pressure conditions, not very high pressure, uh, not like uh, go exceed like 20, 30 GPAs of pressure, no, then there will be a pressure induced, a new type of um, thumb, uh, equilibrium will be created where pressure dependence will come in, but here in general for solids PV work is much much smaller. So H can be written as approximately the same as for this is again for condensed phases for condensed systems which include liquids and solids. However, as you can see that there is still some difference like Cp minus Cv is 1 joule per mole Kelvin. It is not really that small, so right. So, but it is much much smaller if you compare to gases. That is right. Now I give you some aside here. Yeah, this is something where this is a part of means in your solid state physics or in your thermal physics course or something like that you might have learned about it. So this is about the heat capacity of solids. Right? Heat was there is too long and bit it is long. I think you, uh, some of you might have read it. So near room temperature, which states that near room temperature, room temperature is pretty high for physicists. In, for physicists, they deal with temperatures much, much below room temperatures, right? They deal with temperatures which are close to like uh, absolute uh, zero. So uh, they look at temperatures which are like really, really uh, below the room temperature. So as a result, uh, where quantum um, uh, type uh, quantum uh, approximations become very very relevant, um, uh, this quantum nature becomes very very relevant, you do not use Maxwell Boltzmann statistics and stuff, you will learn about it more in your solid state physics courses, but here I will give you an aside because from solid state physics or from the molecular interpretation of, um, of, of uh, thermodynamics, if you look at the uh, molecular version of it or statistical mechanical version of it, you will see that there you are considering atom, uh, atomic description and you are trying to basically uh, find a bridge between this atomic description and the thermodynamic description, macroscopic thermodynamic description. Now in such cases you will see that 
as you have previously we have defined energy internal energy right because we told equipartition theorem and we told that all these gas molecules are colliding and there is this transition of kinetic energy and there is this 3 by 2 kvt right for each gas molecule they are basically they, they have in ideal gas um, uh, in kinetic theory for example you have this equi uh, equipartition theorem 3 by 2 kvt on an average for a monoatomic ideal gas is going to be the energy contribution per m 3 by 2 kvt right now these are the translational degrees of uh, freedom. Now, if you have solids, for example, the solids also vibrate, right? It's like 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 solids. You can think of like there are atoms that are by springs, and the solid the, each atom is like an oscillator, uh, oscillator. So it is oscillating there, and it is vibrating, and it can vibrate along x direction, along y direction, or z direction, right? So you can have like mm, here also you can have three degrees of freedom. Right, if the, the atom is vibrating, oscillating this way or this way or this way. Now, if you look at that, then basically you have 3 by 2 kBT from the translational degrees of freedom and from the vibrational degrees you have 3 by 2 kBT. So, energy per atom of a solid we can generally write as 3 kBT. Right now, if you look at that, energy is three kBT per atom. Heat capacity is del u del t. Right, heat capacity is del u del t. So basically, it is given as three kB. That is something that was observed by Dulong and Pitt. So for most solids, means it includes whether it is copper, whether it is lead, whether it is aluminium, it does not matter. It is approximately going to be three kB per atom. That was what Dulong and Pitt stated. Right. So, basically internal energy as I told you uh, per mole will now become 3 kBT Na where Na is the greater number and Cv for example molar heat capacity if I tell it is like del del T of 3 kBT Na which is basically 3 kB Na which is equal to 3R. Right. 3R per mole. Right. This molar heat capacity of any solid is like 3R per uh, 3R. Right. Molar heat capacity is 3R. Now, as I told, each atom is an oscillator with 6 degrees of freedom is something that uh, we, we are telling that each atom is has having a 6 degrees of freedom, but there are two. Um, uh, so, if that is so, on an average, uh, you know, uh, you can think of uh, uh, half kVT contribution uh, uh, for each degree of freedom. So, half kVT, half kVT, half kVT. So, total basically, uh, if you think of that with 6 degrees of freedom means translational as well as vibrational. And total it is 3k, right? So that's how we are looking at it, right? These are atoms, these are atoms connected by springs in all directions. However, it has been observed that the heat capacity continues to decrease as temperature decreases and heat capacity vanishes as t equal to 0. So Einstein looked at it. So basically, Dulong and Petit's law can explain the high temperature heat capacity, molar heat capacity of solids. However, as you go to lower temperatures, it cannot explain anything. It is Dulong and Petit's law does not even hold, right? It does not even hold as you go to lower and lower temperatures. Particularly, you have to remember that it vanishes at t equal to zero Kelvin. It is quite low, and it then it grows and it goes to Dulong and Petit regime, which is the classical regime. Now, Einstein proposed a model where he considered a solid as a lattice structure. This is obviously correct with n atoms. So, it is like you know, it can be a face the cubic atom, it can be a um, face the cubic lattice, it can be a body centered cubic lattice, simple cubic lattice, tetragonal lattice, whatever. But it is having a lattice structure with some t number of atoms. Now, each atom. What Einstein, again, these are assumptions from Einstein's model. So these are the assumptions. As you can see, solid has a lattice structure, which is correct, right? Solid generally, when we tell a uh, crystal structure of solid, say a crystalline solid, we tell what is a crystal structure? It has a lattice and it has motif. Motif is nothing but atoms, lattice plus motif equal to. So a solid is always associated with an underlying lattice. Right, which is periodic in nature, 
um, right, which has translation of the density, etc., etc., and it has assumed such an allergic structure with n atoms. And we are also telling, or Einstein assumed that each atom moves independently within the lattice in three directions. So basically, it's like a lattice gas. So you have the lattice positions occupied by atoms, and atoms themselves are moving in, 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 independently. That means if I have one atom here in the lattice, say I, let's take a square lattice for example. Now this atom has all the six um, degrees of freedom and it is moving independently. So this one is moving independently, it does not care about this guy's movement, this atom's movement or this one's. Right? So, it does not care about whether this atom is moving this way or this way, it does not matter, it will be moving independently. That was like and it has like and in 3D, so it has uh, basically if you think of in 3D and there is this constraint, we are talking about like 3 degrees of freedom. And we are telling the next point which is like no interactions with each other, each other. there is no interaction between the atoms of a solid. Now that has a, this is a problem, this is not a really a correct assumption because then how comes sound travel through solids? Sound, if sound has traveled through solids, the sound wave has to move through some medium. Now how does it move through a medium? It disturbs some atoms, that these atoms disturb the next ones and so on and so forth and that way the sound, sound can travel through the solid. Now if there is no interaction between atoms in solids, then sound cannot travel. So that it's a fallacy, this assumption is not really correct no interactions with each other is a problematic assumption and there is also another um, assumption that all atoms vibrate the same frequency. So this no interaction is one of the assumptions where we immediately can understand that that is not really true, right. Even heat transfer the way it happens, say for example you have a hot plate made of steel, steel is a solid and uh, it is like uh, it's, uh, you can think of or uh, say some iron plate. Uh, iron, um, uh, solid iron plate and you are hitting say on the back, the, the, the back side and but you are feeling the heat uh, also on the top right otherwise uh, cooking out many things are not possible. Now how is it possible that means heat also has to travel through the solid right. So if there is no interaction how does it travel or sound also has to travel through the solid how does it travel if there is no interaction between atoms. So assumption 2 as you can see is not really correct sound propagation or heat propagation through solid does take place, right. Now with all these assumptions, Einstein de devised on temperature called Einstein temperature. Again, he looked at a different type of statistics. I am not going to, at least th in this part of the lecture, I am not going to go into the detail of these uh, Einstein's derivations and all. But once we go into some statistical mechanical interpretation, we may again come back to it. So here, what we are telling here that sound can propagate through solid, heat can propagate through solid, therefore assumption 2 which is basically atoms do not interact is not correct, right. And now we have this, uh, we have this thermodynamic definition, del U del V and we define something called a theta E which is an Einstein temperature which is equal to H nu by Kb where nu is the frequency of oscillation of these atoms and H is Planck's constant and Kb is Boltzmann's constant. And then we, what we get, we get an expression 3 and Kb. So I am not going to derive the expression, but I am telling that this is some expression that Einstein got. Theta i by t whole squared and theta is h nu by Kb. So it is like h nu by Kb t whole squared and here also this there is some exponential term and stuff. What happens here is as theta i by t, here theta i by t means h nu by Kb t. When it is large, obviously you can understand that T is very small or very low, right. As you go to very low uh, temperatures, theta I by T is very, um, uh, very, very large, then you can basically approximate this exponential theta I by T by you know, theta I by T minus 1 whole square as exponential minus theta I by T which tends to 0 because T is very very low. So this is uh, uh, T is very very small. So this is like minus infinity. It 
2 minus infinity is 0. So, right, so because theta e is h nu by k d and t is very, very small, so this entire theta e by t is approaching, approaching theta e by t is approaching infinity as t tends to 0. Now, if that is so, it will be power minus infinity tends to 0, right. So, as a result, as you can see, Cv tends to 0 as T tends to 0. Now, this is Einstein temperature. As you can see, this is your Dulong-Petit law, 3NKB, Dulong and Petit. Law. And as you can see here, as t tends to 0, as t tends to 0, this is 0, approaching 0, then it increases, 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 and then it merges with the Dulong packet at high temperatures. High temperatures means here I am talking about room temperature as a high temperature. So, high temperature lim limit is as you can see here. Or the classical limit is theta i by t less less than 1. That means t is large, right? t is large. So, if t is large, then you can approximate this as you will see that C v. This is something that you can prove also because you go to this expression. T is very large, right? So, this becomes like small. So, it becomes like very, very small. Here also it is small and here is a theta e by t whole square and there is a theta e by t if you expand and you neglect the terms, you will basically get that theta e by t whole square and theta e by t whole square on on uh, here and here it cancels out and you will finally get this 3 n k b. So basically, I uh, I leave the proof to you. You can you can try this. You can use this approximation, and you will find that C V in such case at high temperature limit becomes equal to three. So you understand. So theta e by t less less than one. That means t becomes very very large. If t becomes very very large, you can show that this because if as you know it will be x. Uh, you can write the series, and you can tell that. Okay, if, if, if t is large, x is small, right, which is theta i by t, right, if t is large, x is very really small. So, you do not go to x square, x cube and stuff. So, you have, for example, e to the power theta i by t, t is very, very large, so this is small, you can think of this as e to the power c, which is equal to 1. Here, you look at this, this can be like 1 plus theta i by t plus theta e by t whole square plus dot 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 minus 1. So, 1 1 goes off and you can tell that ok, these terms are all neglected. So, you have in the denominator theta e by t and here you have theta e by t whole square and basically if you look at that. so uh, you will see this is theta i by t and this is over uh, this is whole square term is there. So, you get a theta i by t whole square in the denominator, theta i by t whole square in the numerator and as a result these things cancel out and you get 3 n k. You can easily see that or 3 n k in n k where n is say a zero number if I take n as n a then C V is nothing but 3 which is Dulong Petit. So, you recover Dulong and Petit as you go to high temperature, you recover C V tends to 0 as T tends to 0 as you go to low temperature for solids. This is Einstein. Now, Peter Debye, he proved on Einstein model. Again, I will not go into all the detail, I will not go into the bose einstein statistics and stuff, but I will tell that Peter Debye introduced something very, very important and you must, must have learned it in solids of physics and that is the concept of phonons or lattice vibrations. So, it is not like one single atom is oscillating independently of the other atom and stuff, but it is basically a collective motion of the lattice which is propagating to the material. 
is like a lattice vibrations that is happening collectively, right? So there are lots of animations of uh, such a lattice, such lattice vibrations. You can see so how these lattice vibrations happen, and lattice vibrations can be different modes. But again, unlike electromagnetic waves, you cannot have like infinite number of modes and stuff, right? So basically. You now introduce a concept called phonon, which is nothing but lattice vibration, and when there is a thermal excitation, like there is a, some 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 heat input and stuff, you will start seeing that there is an excit uh, this excitation passes through the entire lattice uh, as in the form of lattice vibrations. It is propagating through the material. So, if you look at that, now you can define energy of one phonon as h cross omega, where omega is the angular frequency, which is like the speed of sound, effective speed of sound through the solid. And this is the magnitude of the wave vector, right? That wave that is propagated. Now, if you see that because you are having vibrations, right? Oscillations. And the number of phonons is given by the statistics. I am not going to the detail of it. But one thing to note is that phonons do not have infinite modes of frequency. The modes of frequency are limited to the lattice in which we are working, right? So it is basically related to the related to the number of atoms that are there arranged in the lattice, right? It is basically if you think of n primitive unit cells, then you have n modes, maximum n modes of phonon frequency. And there is a maximum allowed frequency that Debye uh, came up with. Again, I am not going to the detailed proof of it, but uh, later when we will go to add more deep into the molecular interpretation or the statistical interpretation of um, or the connect between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, we may try to prove some of this. But currently, we are telling that there is a uh, definitely a molecular connect, and this molecular connect is what we are explaining. And when we are trying to explain this, um, uh, uh, remember CV, CP, all are macroscopically measurable uh, quantities, these are like macroscopic manifestations. but all of these have an atomic or molecular origin and that is what I am talking about. Now, if you look at Debye frequency, there is this is the maximum allowed for phonon frequency in a lattice, right, in a solid. And that is given by omega d, which is related to Vs and it is also related to number density of atoms. N is the number of atoms, V is the volume, right, number density of atoms and there is a 6 pi squared and 3 power 1 power. Now, if you see that the energy is phonon energy, right, times the average, so phonon energy times the average number of phonons times the number of modes because unlike Einstein where he assumed that modes can be infinite, here modes are basically if there are n lattice points or n primitive cells then there are only n phonon modes. Now, you have h cross omega max by kb as the Debye temperature. You have a divide frequency of omega max, which is Vs into this thing, and you have h cross omega is the energy. So h cross omega by kb is your divide temperature. Now, if you have that again after some manipulation, uh, actually divide uh, showed it in a very different way, uh, but uh, you can derive this expression in several ways uh, by looking at again statistical mechanical tools, uh, which we are not dealing with currently. But I want to tell you. So the connect that you get is u is equals to this 9 kbt t by theta d whole cube and 0 to theta d by t x cube by x e to the power x minus 1 kx. At high temperature x is small right at higher temperatures as you go to higher and higher temperatures x is basically um, theta d by uh, t. So, x becomes small right t, 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 t increases so it becomes small. So, if x becomes small then you basically have x cube by e to the power x minus 1. Now, if you think of this, you have x cube by x because 1 plus x minus 1. So, x cube by x is nothing but x square and you have t by theta d whole cube and there is a theta b by t whole cube and then there is a one third. So, it becomes you recover again do long and cut it slow. C v equal to 3 and 3 here. And that low temperature, if you go to the low temperature, you get theta d by t tends to infinity, right? Because as you go to low temperatures and this becomes s cube by dx by t over x minus 1, 0 to infinity becomes pi to the power 4 by 15. And then you have this expression of u and del u del t is your c. 
So you basically get 12 pi power 4 by 5 n kb t by theta d whole kb. And if you plot cv by 3 nk as a function of t by theta d, this is your Einstein curve, but this is the more correct, you can see the dotted lines, is the more correct divide. Uh, you please have a look at it and have a check at it. it means which one is the Einstein model and which one follows the Debye curve. You can have a plot, uh, you can plot it here yourself and you can see. Remember, there is one very interesting outcome of Dulong and Pickett's law. At room temperature, copper and lead both have the same heat capacity. Molar heat capacity of lead and copper are same, which is 3R. Now, if that is so, how are they different? They are different. We know that. They are different because the specific heats are different. Right? Because this is joule per mole Kelvin which is 3 R. But as you can see here, you can easily verify. If you look at the atomic mass for example, here it is there. So, you have 3.6 for copper, lead is 207. So, as you can see here, 3R in one case it is 3R by 207 in another case right is joule per mole Kelvin is this mole you are converting to gram so if you do that so uh, molecular weight so or atomic weight so 207 is for lead right this is joules per gram Kelvin and for copper it is 3R by 63.6 which is for copper this two per immediately you can see that this is much larger than this one so lead has lower specific heat than copper lead has lower specific heat than copper ok now I will go through a, another very interesting observation that again can be explained from first law and from the knowledge of CPCV and enthalpy is that we will look at adiabatic flow through a valve and this becomes very very important for real gases because this is a this joule Thomson expansion is something that is used for refrigeration right it is this and this process a very interesting process I will come up with and that process is called isoenthalpic process isoenthalpic means we know about isovolume, we know about isobaric, we know about isothermal. Isoenthalpic means the enthalpy remains the same, right? So, let us have a look at this adiabatic flow through a valve very quickly. So, uh, if you look at the inlet and the outlet and this is a system and adiabatic means heat cannot be added to the system, cannot be removed from the system and you have this valve here you are so you press some uh, you press a gas here and then you just move a piston this way and you will see that the gas expands and while the real gas expands it causes cooling this is something that we will show so the so real gases as i was telling cool upon expansion and this process is adiabatic that means the enthalpy or heat content does not change Right, and then you can define a joule Thomson coefficient which is eta jp, which is del p del p at constant enthalpy. Right now, again, h is a state function, so dh is an exact differential, so dh again can be written as delta h del h by del p t, del h by del p p, and there are this reciprocal. So, this is something that you can have a look at as I told you, partial differentiation, our knowledge of partial differentiation is very important. When you understand, try to understand thermodynamics and reciprocal entities, I think this is something that all of us know del x by del x z equal to 1 by del x del y z. And this Euler chain rule is something quite interesting if z is a function of x and y, you can write and you can prove this del y del x z. So, del y del x at fixed z, del x del z at fixed y, del z del y at fixed x, these all as you can see, this is a chain rule. Now you see here del z, here there is a del z, here is a del x, del x, del y, del y and this is equal to minus 1. Now if that is so, you can use this identity or this Euler chain rule in many places. 
please try to prove this this is something that is very important and you know about this so as you can see here i can i have taken h as a function of p and t it's like z as a function of x and y then i use del h del p t del p del p h del p del h p and this becomes minus 1 so if you see here you have a del p del p h and what is your theta j t it is del t del p h so we can also use the reciprocal identity so if i have this so we can write del h del p t equals to minus 1 by del p del p h del t del h p now this becomes minus of del t del p h del h del p p so d h equals to minus del t del p h right del h del t p which is c p and here again there is a c p p p so for isoenthalpic process as you know d h equal to 0 right d h equal to 0 that is isoenthalpy and you get d h equals to minus eta j t c p d p plus c p d t and then because d h equal to 0 I can tell and c p can cancel we get eta j t equals to del p del p at constant right so you can see how we got the joule thompson coefficient for isoenthalpic process right and as i told you that you have a gas a real gas this is upstream so you move the piston this way you compress it completely now downstream you are basically expanding it right you are just moving the piston away from right and the gas is allowed to expand so pf is going in general all is less than pi right so pf is less than pi and you have isothermal compression here and you have isothermal expansion here and if you look at that you have wy which is basically you you started with a volume vi say for example the volume is vi and it goes to zero right we are compressing it so much that the volume goes to zero so minus vi to zero pdv which is basically going to be pi vi this is work done on the system minus pdv so and wt is minus pf vf minus zero which is minus pf pf so as you can see the change in energy here because it is uh, adaptive is uf change in terms of energy is uf minus ey which is pi vi minus pf vf and if you now arrange uf plus pf vf is hf and ui plus pi vi is hi so you can see that indeed the process is iso right so as i told for real gases dt the change in temperature is related to change in pressure right so there is a tf minus ti it is equal to eta jt pf minus ti right so and as i told you del t del ph again from our chain rule you can say uh, that del t del ph is nothing but minus of del h del p p and this is del h del p p and the unit of this uh, Kelvin per Pascal and all real gases have an inversion point where eta gt changes sign right so inversion temperature for oxygen for example is 491 degrees Celsius so at below inversion temperature eta jt is equal to is greater than 0 now eta jt is greater than 0 dp if eta jt has to be greater than 0 as you can see which is del T del P H since D P is less than 0 right D P is less than 0 D T has to be less than 0 and you get what is called cool right if you have Joule Thompson expansion below inversion temperature what you get is cool above inversion, uh, inversion temperature your eta jt is itself negative now D P is less than 0 right D P is still less D P is always less than 0 that is what I we have told right P F is less than pi where dp is less than 0 then dt has to be now greater than 0 now dt has to so above inversion temperature joule thomson thomson expansion causes warming and below inversion temperature where eta jt is greater than 0 since dp is less than 0 you will always get dt to be less than 0 right because eta jt because remember the eta, eta jt is what it is del t del p del t del p h now if dp is negative del t has to be negative because eta jt has to be positive so below inversion 
temperature, you will always see joule thumbs and expansion causes cooling. Above inversion temperature, it becomes the opposite, uh, it causes warming. So, for ideal gases, if you see, as we have already mentioned very quickly, pi t equals to del u del v t. And if you see this del h del p t, if you look at the proof here quickly, del h del p t is del u del p t plus p del v del p t plus p. Now, you have del u del v, del v del p, this is from chain rule. So, this you are writing as this minus p nrt by p square del v. Now, nrt by p square is nothing but uh, nrt by p is nothing but v. So, minus v plus v becomes 0 and this uh, guy del u del v itself is 0. So, as a result, eta j t for ideal gases equal to 0. Right. So, from next class onwards, I will start with the reversible, I, I will just tell one or two uh, more important points of reversible adaptive expansion, then I will start with the uh, second law. Right. So, we will start with the second law. Uh, so, we will look at the reversible adaptive expansion because we just want to know what is the, we know the Cp minus Cv, but what about Cp by Cv and this is why is it become, why does it become useful. So, we will look at a uh, reversible adaptive expansion uh, in the next class. But remember, this joule thompson expansion coefficient eta j t for ideal gases is C. Okay. So, if you have any questions, please post those questions to uh, us. We will have a look at if you have any doubt, we will try to we will try to get back to this emails and we will try to.